So let's talk more Sanko Cushion. There is still not a ton of information, but on the Facebook page, they actually posted a compilation of all of the lore and all of the Facebook posts and artwork and mentions that another interested party, another individual person out there had put together and they put it in sort of a Google Doc spreadsheet. And so they actually just said, here, here's the link. Someone did this as a compilation for all of our stuff. So we didn't have to do it for you guys. And so you guys can get all the information in one place. So I have that link. I will throw it in the comments below. But as I did with the New Year's update, because I think people really like that. So you don't have to try and dig through it. I am going to break it down for you so that you can have an idea of what else do we know that's out there. Because as the problem with the New Year's update was, <laughs> we just want more information. And we want to digest it. They have announced that I think like within the next month, they're going to have more of a firmer sense of when the Kickstarter date is going to be. Not necessarily they're going to announce it. Originally, it was thought to be in quarter one. I wonder, and it would not surprise me, if that easily got pushed to quarter two at this point. Because we're already approaching the end of January. We're leaning into February. If you're telling me it's going to take a couple weeks before you're going to know exactly more of when it's going to be, you're already talking the end of March, you're not going to probably launch it within a month of announcing it. So you're already talking beginning of quarter two. So as I said, actually, it's really nice. We'll take a look at this Google document. It breaks it down actually by sections. So you can see the different sections, the different elements of the gameplay, some examples of cards, some examples of monsters, some lore all over the place. It's beautifully done. It's a little slow to load sometimes. So if, if there's that part of things, just FYI, let's take a look. So here you go. Um, and again, they, they put it up right here. Quarter one, 21 is when it's expected. So again, just sort of the intro, you get the nice art, you get a little big overview of things. And, you know, that's about it. This is just the intro welcome page. They actually throw the Discord link in there too. So if you want to join the Discord, I'm sure there's tons of speculation out there uh, as well. So let's go straight into the hero introductions here. So um, you just, as I mentioned in the New Year's update there, you have your four starting characters. Umeka, Nene, Nobuyuki and Tenzin. All of them have a little bit different backstory. And as we saw on the New Year's update, you can see a little bit of what makes them unique. And so you here you have a little bit of their starting equipment, stylish shawl, which is represented obviously on the model too. And then you have your golden mist greaves. And you can see on the bottom here, again, we've got the different iconography, which we still don't know. I don't think quite what it does, but then you've got different abilities already on the uh, greaves, as well as these keywords on both of these that I think are going to play a larger role in some of the events and the scenarios. And like I mentioned before in the New Year's update, these benefit you, but they can also benefit your teammates. If, for example, this ability right here says gain one evasion or, or an ally adjacent gains one evasion. So it's not just affecting you. It has the ability to help others around you. Let's take a look at a few of these others. Again, you have a sword, you have a cloak, you reduce any push you suffer by one, and then the sword is a shield breaker upgrade. Spend one additional tension to break two barriers instead of one. So again, we have other keywords, other elements that we're not quite familiar with yet. Ninja suit, kunai, her father's kunai, flanking, you gets you plus one precision, and you get plus one uh, attack, I'm assuming that is, during speech actions against adjacent humans. <laughs> Maybe that's not attack. That would be really weird if that was attack. Um... And again, knife, technique, weapon, accessory, light protection. So obviously there's going to be probably some bonus with sets and you're going to see some of wordplay there as well. Now let's go a little bit into the enemies and the encounters and they've sort of stacked them here. The Karakuri is the first enemy they say that you're uh, approaching as the party. Strong attacks, shadow control, and you know, if you can't move, it's going to obliterate you, it says. It says it's a machine, so it's not feeling pain. And that's one of the main guys I think you see actually on the front of the box. It has a machine, though. This is the lore. And I'm thinking the lore is going to give you a little bit of a clue how else you may be able to interact with it. And it's here it says that the potential to develop a conscience. So could you use your psychological warfare to affect this guy to get him to ally with you? Heroes can either work with the machine as it gains sentience or exploit its underdeveloped personality to seize control. So that's interesting. And now you get a little bit de more detailed look at what actually the card is made of. You've got this side card over here. It hesitates for a moment as it understands your words. Perhaps you can interact with the creature, plus one key. And so you can empathize, intimidate, or defy. And depending on what you do, 
makes it do different actions. And it has a behavior here. Reveal automaton status card at the start of his act. Perform automaton. Standard attack is this. Collision does this, and that's that push mechanism, which we see in KDM as well, that can cause you to get moved significantly or damaged if you're reaching the edge of the, uh, you know, arena or that play area. Um, I'm assuming six is your movement here, four is your defense, and then psychology defense, negate one psychology icon of your choice. So again, you see the heavy featuring of psychology, even within the very first monster that you're fighting. Now we go down one, we have the Skull Samurai. Terrifying opponent, a couple lore things linked to the sins mechanic. We've seen that mentioned once or twice elsewhere. A special opponent that only appears in specific situations and it heavily depends on your past actions. So are you a sinner and you're having a lot of sin or is it going to potentially appear as a third party when you're fighting someone else who may have sinned extensively? So are you going to stand in its way or are you going to work alongside of it essentially? So you may be left in a different scenario depending on how your interactions again have been past influencing it. They literally say here in the, in the text, in case you can't read it, the Skull Samurai is theoretically unbeatable in the early mid game, but physical concentration is not the only way you can face it. Perhaps he may listen to you and stop his hand for at least a turn or two. Psychology is not solely the main way to debuff your foes, but also to influence their behavior and immediate consequences on the encounter, as well as permanent effects on the campaign course. So uh, again, movement this movement and this shield you can see already six and four nine and seven psychological defense looks like you might be rolling dice to see what sort of ability it has there and standard attack it looks like it's again much stronger than what you saw or it's easier to hit biako uh we saw this one again i think in the new year's update as the, a guardian of the beast of the west you know definitely it looks like this is something that you're going to be harvesting potentially to get armor from because they're actually talking about it being a, a white tiger that, um, you know, maybe I'll do. He's an opponent I would never harm. Or maybe I'll do. His armor set is beautiful. So it looks like, again, you're going to have something going along with that. Standard attack looks like a very unique uh, way it's going to be attacking. Psychological defense, three dice there. Again, 10 and 7. So again, you're you're seeing the ramp up already that you're going to be have to be matching with the equipment uh, changing to be able to even hit something like this. And I'm guessing that this is going to be very important too in terms of uh, being able to hit it. And if you look very closely on the side of these cards, which I didn't notice at first, the text here in the vertical fashion, this is your encounter deck. This on this side is the psychology deck. So you're gonna have two ways of potentially interacting if you're trying to attack sort of like the KDM decks where you flip and see where you hit and see what happens if you hit or what happens if you miss. A couple more here that we'll go through quickly. Endless Rain. It's a human. Next boss to be revealed. Her unseen bending art allows her to partially manipulate the casual flux. So manipulating the deck, manipulating the events, manipulating your deck. What is it going to look like? Um, target hero with the fewest negative modifiers. So she is, there's a rain token. So casual flood. So you're going to see maybe some more environmental interactions that the enemies have the ability to control. Psychological defense. Her stats are a little bit different. The rain aura is torrential. All heroes within three spaces suffer push 10. I mean, these are not uh, simple, straightforward things. And these are massive changes between. And so I, I would imagine, I think that's part of the reason they delayed things is because the balancing has to be so extensively great on these. Again, here you have another guy, uh, Katsu, combat mechanics, the next boss, unpredictable emotions, tendency to obsess over any that show her affection, destroy anyone that attempts to target her twisted emotions. So how you attack there, again, is going to be completely different. Got some lightning damage there, uh, some psychology, as well as some encounter. And then you've got a couple of these other ones that are mentioned. Uh, the Aizenami from the other Kickstarter campaign for the model. So it looks like we're going to have a special boss there with a special boss deck. Hino Katsuguchi as well. Not much there. And Tomo. So again, a lot of stuff going on here. The artwork is fantastic. You've already seen not all of these have cards, but a lot of deep, uh, interesting mechanics that are highly variable. So let's move on to the gear. I, we've looked at a little bit of the gear already, and a lot of the uh, gear that you see here already is the stuff blown up with this from the starting gear. So it's just a little bit easier to read or to check out if you want and pause the video and get a little bit more reading and looking at the symbols and the numbers that go along with them. Again, not sure exactly what all of these mean. You obviously have shield, which is more self-evident. I'm assuming these are the attack dice on the kunai that you're using. But then you also have this diamond shape here that's different. 
and you have a red shield here versus a gray shield. So I'm not sure what the difference is there as well. Now, what they say is that these have special abilities in combat. You continue to expose your character to the spirits within the weapons. The spirits passing their knowledge to you increases. So again, another layer upon layer. Gear that plays off each other or key mechanics when used. So a mechanic similar to Monster Hunter. Oh, I just talked about Monster Hunter the other day. And Final Fantasy 13 with synergies between gears that do not exactly look good together. And you have to discover synergy scrolls to be able to use them better. So you're going to have types, your organic, mechanical, and ritual. Durability, which we didn't see as much of in KDM. I mean, yes, you can break things in certain elements, but a lot of it, durability is much less of an issue in that game. And then you have accessories. So take care of your equipment, um, allow you to negate attacks, just like in KDM. Uh, you may perform three or more stress. You may perform invisible resonance. So again, all these keywords are going to be really heavily used and it's just adding layer upon layer upon layer. And it's making me more and more interested the more I look at this. Now, again, with KDM, going back to the comparison, you have sets that are going to achieve your bonus. Work in progress, but you can see that obviously there's going to be some way when you have more of these sets, and I don't see anything on these cards, but I'm assuming there's going to be some special bonus and way to figure out what the bonus would be if you have two or three or, you know, maybe it's just all four. No idea. Then you have some more of your extras, just more equipment, some more renders, uh, some more cards, uh, potentially uh, the bow that we saw in the New Year's update, and then two other uh, weapons here, it looks like, or armor pieces or miscellaneous. So again, um, this looks like it's got a lot going on. And so this is not a hammer, a mark of soul. It's not going to be something very straightforward. There's going to be a lot of analysis and a lot of tactical nature, I think, in the combat, but there's going to be a lot of strategy that goes into the equipping beforehand, maybe even more so than Kingdom Death. A little bit of front and back, a little bit of the terrain tokens, uh, environment that we talked about with that enemy with the rain. So who knows how much that's going to be. And then this is one of the special events or attacks that you can do. And then that's it. Now let's talk location here for a second. This was the big picture on the New Year's update. This is the main city of Yamashiro. So you can craft equipment here. There's festivals, expand the city, uh, basically take advantage of all the amenities that it has, it says. And there's going to be relationships within the NPCs and the inhabitants of this city in the first place. Workshop where you're going to upgrade weapons and create new ones. Interior ministry where you're going to you're going to start there, sort of with a tutorial encounter, sort of as the government. When I mentioned the two factions in the New Year's update, I'm guessing that this may be where they're going to play a strong role. Also, it mentions the tears of Yume, which I think were those healing things for that root virus that was sort of talked about in the New Year's update. And then you've got your battle board or your dance board. And this is really intriguing. Now, the question, again, always with boards is, is this going to be a foldable board? How is it going to be made? How is it going to fold? Are you going to offer a play mat? Are you going to offer a higher quality one at a different price? What's going to be the issue? What is the dance mat? How do these things differ? What do all these markings mean? Again, we have very little information on that. Now, the mechanisms. You can play it as a solo, but it's going to be a co-op game. This is your this is your heavy co-op game. You can split your group, actually, it says, in the city phase. So this may be different than KDM, where you have just everybody sort of sitting around together making these decisions. Okay, we're going to forge this here, and we're going to do this. So you may be limited in between your interactions, because we know, based off the New Year's update as well, that there is a time frame. You know, that these events are going to be happening in the background, and you either have the choice to interact with them and do them within a certain time frame, or they may pass you by and there's going to be consequences because it is ever moving in time. But it says here that you are allowed to split your group in order to be more efficient during that time. So you could give a soul player freedom so wide, send two heroes to fight a boss while another is speaking with the priestess in the last of repairing weapons. That's pretty massive. I don't know how I would do that with a table. Like, okay, you guys go fight over there. I'm just going to be doing stuff over here and you guys will get back to me when you're done. <laughs> So, and then it says the chrono fiction technique, a secret technique makes it possible even in multiplayer so that nobody has to wait while the other players are fighting with their characters. That's, well, they appear to be already thinking about that. That is again, layer upon layer upon layer. Now, this is where they're differing. They're saying, you know what? You don't have to read a bunch of narration. You know, we're going to give you, you know, the option to read through some of these missions. You can do different storylines that you can discover by making your own choices. You can interact with citizens, enemies. By not interacting with them, the, the events are going to unravel without you really knowing why, what's going on. So the more you do, the more you'll know, the more you'll understand. Now, how much of it do you have to understand to be able to complete more? 
you know, do it less at your own risk, I guess, is essentially another way of saying it. So the less you do, the less you may understand, the less you may be able to complete or do to the extent in which you may want to if you're not going to be curious in nature about it in the first place. Now, here we go. Rhetoric. This is more of your art of persuasion on the psychology side of things. You're training this, actually, which is interesting. Each enemy reacts differently to your attempts with interacting with them, which we saw on the enemy cards. And so this is the rhetoric dice. And you start with one of these generic die and you can sort of build your skills up. And so we saw that a little bit on some of those colored icons that different colors are representing different dice, obviously, than different sides and different abilities or more successes, I guess you might say. So here we go at the bottom here, and I just mentioned the time frame element. At the beginning of the week, each hero gains three time points that can be spent while inhabiting the city. So here we go. This is a little bit more of what I was talking about is how are you going to manage the city and the time? And how are you going to accomplish what they just mentioned above where you could have people splitting off and doing completely different things, including fighting, breeding, forging, constructing, training and encounter. So they all cost different things. and You have a combination of things that you can do and you may have to pool some of your points in order to do certain activities. Stances, we talked a little bit about stances just briefly, I think in the update, increases your odds to hit, increases your chances of parrying and their available maneuvers. You choose your stance wisely because you can do three actions during your party's turn. Each stance gets you a specific type of die that's used to hit and parry. So again, changing the odds of how you're gonna be rolling in order to mitigate it in your favor. Lower stance, safer, less powerful, Mid stance, great defense, balanced, good for support. And then a high stance, low accuracy, but boy, are you going to do damage if you hit. It's tempting, but it's risky. So go big or go home, especially if your hero hasn't been buffed or your enemy hasn't been knocked off guard. This one's going to be more high risk, high reward. And, you know, they actually say, interesting note, you must debuff your enemy or buff your party. Focusing fire is useless if you want to have a decent chance of winning. KDM, you see it mostly through the equipment, but there's apparently going to be some buffs and debuffs that you're just going to have to be using really intuitively sort of like your white mage final fantasy sort of thing it's going to become a necessary party member or party inclusion to be able to actually hit these guys in the first place because you saw just with a couple glances at those enemies that we've seen the stats go up considerably in terms of being able to hit them very quickly also many of the items the encounter cards the skills they say have to be done in a certain stance so you're going to get different elements working differently depending on what stance people are in Again, this is a lot of information, but it makes me actually, instead of trepidatious with information overload, it just makes me more excited to be completely honest here, you know, more salivating than uh, trembling. Key, tension, stress. We saw stress mentioned with uh, some of the enemies. Key and tension mechanics, uh, two sides of the same token. You can spend them to form actions. Key transforms into tension. Uh, you may have to manage it carefully. So it's a balancing act. And if you get too much stress, because it's going to take up your slot, your ability to use the key and develop different symptoms depending on their own personal personality traits or psychoses. Uh, when you uh, suffer damages or wounds, you can put them all over the accessories and accessories have to be repaired. And then they actually mention here, again, another little insight, avoiding wounds in the middle guard stance, which we mentioned is the best defensive stance. We mentioned the tier of Yumi before, wound, resin, front. So getting down to the bottom here, we talked about psychology, a game to inflict debuffs. It's a way to inflict debuffs on your boss. And they may also suffer a debuff as a consequence of a wound, but that's rare. I mean, you know, sort of like when you chop off certain parts of the lion in Kingdom Death and it gets a negative. Psychology checks, a roll, there you go. What does it mean? You spend the icons. The attitude can be spent in order to achieve some effects, but you can do both of these. So you've got a couple examples of a psychopath uh, with, depending on the stress, uh, seductive, depending on the, the role you want here, punk out or charge of the expendables. <laughs> and then postures uh, going down here. So now we get down to this is a ton of information, by the way. I didn't know half of this stuff. You're getting into postures. What are postures? Um, you know, how your martial artist has perfect control over their abilities and the enemies and their abilities to counter these. A flavor system to enhance the skilled sword to sword combat essentially, is, is what they talk about here. Each opponent has a posture level that influences their wound threshold, which is sort of their endurance, and then damage reduction, as well as reactions and their own attacks. Striking an enemy whose posture is perfect may lead to worse reactions. You're going to take more damage if they're all prepped and ready. You don't want to just blindly attack. Otherwise, you're going to probably get counterattacked pretty significantly. 
So you're acting in a way to break their posture, to break their cool, to break their calm, to open an exploit or an opening that you can take advantage of. And then they actually give you a weak spot here represented by an icon corresponding to the guard stance a hero must be in. So I'm guessing it's going to be one of these on here and it's going to tell you exactly what you're going to need to be doing. And here they actually show you the break card of what you're going to be looking at down here. If I can pull it up here for you, the way you're fighting with them, especially the example here being the Skull Samurai again, there's going to be consequences, 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 consequences. Okay. Now, if it isn't obvious by this point, there is a whole heck of a lot of world building going on here. Um, this is not just, we're just going to throw a bunch of stuff together and sort of see if it clicks. There is a whole world behind this. As I said before, with those encounters that you may or may not be doing, stuff is going to unravel. There's a lot of stuff going on in the background. I think even from the get-go, that only time or even replayability will really allow you to gauge the full depth of. And so here you've got your ritual cards You've got sort of these um, ability uh, condition cards, and then you've got these trait cards uh, that are traits are obviously obviously what you would think. Condition cards is sort of like just what it says, uh, you know, similar to abilities or conditions that you get in KDM. And then rituals are going to be things that are going to allow you to, I think, get special abilities or special resources in that sense. They really emphasize here, especially with the rituals, that the enemies and the allies that you meet are not just cliche but they have their disturbed and sorrowful and depth with their backstory themselves, and they may hide some of that, and that's not easily apparent from the get-go. Encounters, you're not just going to fight them to crush and loot them like you are in most games, where you're going to interact with them in many other ways that we've talked about, the psychological, the emotional way, in order to have a more deeper interaction and effect throughout the battle, but also the gameplay as it extends through the campaign. And they flat out say here, again, during encounters, you can decide to simply fight them or interact with them using speech and diplomacy. They all have their own personality. They all react, react differently to diplomacy. And they all change their behavior during their fights based on what you try and do. It might be try and wise to intimidate an enemy that has low self-confidence, but <laughs> it may only enrage someone else. So especially if they weren't considering battling you beforehand. So reading the room in that sense is going to be very important, which you don't really see in a lot of card games. They even talk about here that the enemy may adapt. So if you have a group with heavy ranged weapons, the enemy's abilities may change in order to negate or to deal with how you have initially approached them. There's an enemy, there, each enemy has its own story log where players record the outcomes of the fight, changes in the enemy's attitude towards the whole party or even individual characters. So again, it's not just going to be kill loot as they mentioned. The relationships are going to be very important, which is going to subsequently un affect unlocking story branching, disasters, rewards, all of those things as a trickle-down effect depending on what happens in the actual battle. We've talked about this above with some of the equipment. This is Yomi. This is a teamwork, essentially, ability that you're using together that are going to give more than just the individual parts. The sum is going to be more than the individual parts in that sense. And there's three ways, essentially, to deal with it. Empathy, provocation, or intimidation. And it allows you to affect the bosses as well as uh, the citizens, but your, your own teammates as well. Time management, they talk about years. We talked about the week system up above. It's progressing over the course of 12 months. They're considering using moons divided you know, into uh, four-week sections within these months. And astronomy is going to be key as well, as you saw on that white tiger enemy, where it's definitely being used in terms of its abilities and its AI. Social bonds, we talked about that with the bond that you're going to be making with the NPCs throughout the game. The core game, it says, has 10 social bonds, and you're going to be discovering them and unlocking them. It's a link between your group and a citizen. It, each citizen is going to have a social bond that will make up their story arc and unlock new items, skills, and encounters. And they expand just your knowledge of what's going on. And you want to be careful because they will often link together to help you explain more of the story that you didn't know in the first place. Some may die when they reach their goals finally. Some may you never, never have the opportunity to meet depending on how you do things. But they literally say there's no wrong choice. One is not necessarily going to be inherently better than the other. It's just going to depend. And how you interact and how you use them is going to give you a different result. As with all of these characters, and we saw a couple of them, like with the factions, the bonds have different levels, and the higher the bond, sort of your higher your allegiance or higher your 
feelings in that faction or related to that faction gives you better interactions, sort of like a different facility, an alternate facility, they said, like an alternate forge or an alternate training dojo or something like that, depending on which bond it is. And I think we saw two or three of those specifically if you go back and look at the New Year's update. Here we go. These are all the renders that are out there. Again, that looks like a 3D print, so I hope that that's a little bit improved. I think the render looks much better. I'm guessing that will be clarified. Something like this scares me because of how easy it's going to break, and being able to put that together as a non-miniature person, that kind of terrifies me. This is secondhand, to be honest with you at this point. Um, I'm really just impressed by it in the first place, and the gameplay is going to be the make it or break it for me in the first place regardless. There's a little bit of videos that are out there that they link to here in the end, a little bit of FAQ, and so that is about it. That's everything, which is a ton more than what we had in the New Year's update. So what do you think? After seeing that, how does that make you feel? Are you more excited by that? Are you less excited by that? Are you just digging for more information and uh, drooling at the thought of getting more and more and more closer to this. Personally, again, I, there's a reason, and this just emphasizes it without even knowing three quarters of this stuff uh, before 2021. This is the reason why this was my number one most anticipated Kickstarter campaign launching in 2021. And this just reemphasizes that fact. I doubt anything is going to knock it off its pedestal this year. Maybe Seventh Cross, but I, there's so little information about that in the first place. I am, you know, putting that in the back seat right now. So, what do you think? Like I said, I will throw the link in the comments below so you can check it out for yourself. Let's talk. It's gonna be. It's gonna be coming out. There's gonna be more and more and more. I think they're going to be actively updating that as sort of a live file so you can bookmark it and see if stuff pops up in there because they post stuff on the Facebook page, you know, every week or two. So it's kind of an irregular schedule. But as we get closer, there's going to be more and more coming out. They've said they responded to my previous video and said that flat out it's not going to be KDM level prices. So if you were worried about $400, $500 Kickstarter prices, it's not going to be there. I think it's probably going to be similar to sort of the primal or the Monster Hunter board game price where you're looking at between two and 300 where the core might be less. It just depends on how big the core is and how they divvy up expansions. So we'll see. As always, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed my rambling. Thanks for dealing with me. If you liked it, if you want to see more of this, uh, shoot me a sub. I'm trying to get to 2021 and 2021. I want to get a community. YouTube says I have to have more subscribers to even do the community thing. So I'd love to get to that. If you like this as well, throw me a Patreon. I've got like six right now, which is freaking fantastic. And I'm just going to try and make more of this stuff. So uh, I hope you like it. I'll see you around. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Stay classy.